Now that, the, now, the, now sing the... <laughs> All right there, you little demons. Jules here for WhatCulture.com. Back again with another episode of the awesomely named and awfully hosted Choose Your Own Adventure, the weekly medieval theme format where I, the crown jewels of WhatCulture.com, take a list chosen by you. Yes, you. So, so was that... Was that What's this? Oh, sorry. Yes, this is just my star player award that I got from a recent Blood Bowl tournament. You know, the award that they give out for the best player, the person that they had the most fun playing. I may have lost nearly all of my matches, but I think that's probably why people took pity on me and gave me this. I won't read too much into that. Yes, you get to decide what list I dole out to you each and every week. And this week we have none other to thank than... <laughs> Indescribable, but not necessarily for their suggestion, but because their comment really inspired me to create today's video. Because they dropped a knowledge bomb on me that, you know, in last week's episode when I was going on about money. Now, if you've seen the Tom and Jerry movie, you'll know that I love to quote that lawyer character who just goes, money. Money. It turns out that the voice actor who did this actually was an elder god in Soul Reaver. Didn't know that. But then it got me thinking, what other pieces of gaming trivia do you need to know? Well, that's why I teamed up with Jack Pooley and Sai to make this video for you, lucky dogs. So let's have a chat about them as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 20 incredible gaming trivia facts you need to know. Number 20. Clouds and bushes are the same sprite in Super Mario Brothers. So let's start off with something you'll definitely kick yourself for never noticing. And if you did somehow, bravo you weirdo. Because it turns out that the clouds and bushes in Super Mario Brothers both use the same sprites. They're just recolored. And the reason behind all of this? Well, actually, though it's never been confirmed, this was likely actually less laziness than it was just efficiency on part of the developers to work with the Nayers' technological limitations and recycle the same sprite for two different objects. We do the same thing here at What Culture. It's just whenever there is an egg, they sometimes use my face and vice versa. Size so probably just put a PNG of an egg on my face, didn't she? Yeah, thank you. Thank you! Number 19. In 1995, Doom was installed on more home computers than Windows 95. Now, legendary first-person shooter, Doom, was released in 1993 to universal acclaim. And because becoming the standard bearer for an entire genre wasn't enough, by 1995, it was installed on more home computers around the world than even Windows 95. Now, granted, Doom was distributed freely via shareware and Windows 95 was a costly piece of software upon launch, but even so, it's a testament to the shooter's incredible market penetration (laughs) penetration, that it beat out such a ubiquitous brand of operating system. This prompted Microsoft's Bill Gates to consider buying developer id Software, though ultimately it never came to pass. But it has come to Game Pass! Whee! That's me, trying to find an audience, reeling out there for a joke. Right. Number 18. Batman Arkham Asylum's combat was originally a rhythm minigame. Did you know that Batman Arkham Asylum's signature combat was almost a rhythm-based minigame? It's true, it's true, Kurt Angle, it's true. Because a 2009 Game Informer interview with Rocksteady revealed that the game's combat went through three major revisions, with the final positioning it as a rhythm game in which you presumably just needed to smack around goons to the beats. In fact, there was actually a video game that did exactly that. This isn't in the script, it just popped into my mind. It was like kick beat, something like that. It was like a fighting game, but it was all to do with like uh, matching it to the rhythm of the game. It was fantastic fun. It was like Sifu if you were just playing to the beat, making it into like a little like music video fighting montage. Great times, great times. Let's get back on track. Now, given that there is an inherent rhythm to the combat in the final game, it does make a certain amount of twisted sense, even if Rocksteady were probably smart to ditch the minigame. Although, I would have liked to hear like Bruce Wayne humming along as he did that. He's just uh, like... Watch out then. It's the battering. 
It's 7.30 in the morning. It's too early for this nonsense. Number 17. The Japanese version of Fallout 3 won't let you detonate the Megaton nuke. Now, in the Japanese version of Fallout 3, the side quest, The Power of the Atom, is censored in a rather unique way. Now, while all other versions of this game allow players to rig the Megaton nuke to detonate, the Japanese release cuts out the character Mr. Berg, meaning that you're never given that choice. Now, in case it wasn't obvious why Japan opted to change this quest is because of their cultural sensitivity towards depictions of atomic bomb detonations in light of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Number 16. Most of GoldenEye's developers had never worked on a game before. Now here's one to really melt your brain. Not only was the incredible N64 shooter GoldenEye 007 only developed by 11 people, that's one more than my hands have, nine of those people, I actually, I can't, I can't, oh, nine people, actually she had never worked on a video game before. Then the end result wasn't merely a passable game, but one of the greatest licensed video games, and say it with me kids, of all time, and better still, one of the most influential FPS games ever made, is nothing short of astonishing. Who needs experience, apparently, when you've got that much skill and enthusiasm? Number 15, Final Fantasy VII was almost an N64 exclusive. Though Final Fantasy VII is inextricably entwined with the original PlayStation, things almost worked out entirely differently. You see, Square Enix had actually began developing the game in 1994 for the Schneers, but when they decided to push from 2D to 3D, the publisher had two parts ahead of them, the Nintendo 64 or the PlayStation. And so they set about producing a test for the N64, which generated a rather low frame rate, and combined with the increasing costs of manufacturing cartridges, prompted Square Enix to pick the PlayStation instead. Just think, if there had been just a few tweaks, a few things differently, we would all be praising the Nintendo 64 as being the birthplace of, like, the modern RPG for most people. Number 14. Gordon Freeman originally looked like a biker in Half-Life. Half-Life's Gordon Freeman is one of the most iconic video game protagonists, and say it with me, kid, uh, of all time. It's large part because he basically just looks like the most regular, ordinary dude imaginable. And if I've insulted anyone who cosplays as that person, I'm not saying that you look ordinary. But seriously, he's an everyman. That's the whole point of this. But that wasn't always the plan. You see, the original Gordon Freeman design, lovingly nicknamed Ivan the Space Biker, depicted old Gordy as a decidedly more scary looking dude with a flat top haircut, piercing eyes, and a massive, mossy beard. Thankfully, somebody made the smart call to give Gordon a more relatable redesign, and the rest is history. Although, Ivan the Space Biker. Put a pin in that, because we need to see more of whatever that's about. <laughs> Number 13. Roller Coaster Tycoon was made by just four people. Roller Coaster Tycoon, aka Rich Hudson's big old boner, is one of gaming's all-time great success stories, especially considering that the game was made by an unfathomably small team, which was relative to the complexity and artistry of the project. You see, this management sim was entirely designed and programmed by Chris Sawyer, the graphics were handled by Simon Foster, Alistair Brimble was responsible for the sound and music, and some additional audio was provided by David Ellis. Just for people. That makes up the entire game's core team, which is an even more impressive result given that Roller Coaster Tycoon went on to become a sales juggernaut, netting Sawyer an eye-watering $30 million in royalties in the process. Not a bad shift. Number 12. Pac-Man's design was inspired by a pizza. Though you might have assumed, like many, that Pac-Man was both named and designed after a hockey puck, that is not even remotely true. As it turns out, designer Toro Iwatani was partially influenced by a pizza that he had while out on lunch one day. Somebody took out a slice, leaving a gaping mouth-like void, and in turn inspired a character design which would become a near-instantly iconic thing upon Pac-Man's release. If you saw this this scene in a biopic about his life, he'd scoff. But it actually happened because somebody else was scoffing a piece of pizza. Amazing! Number 11. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask was made because of a bet. Right. Believe it or not, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask was made less due to artistic interpretation and more because of a bet between game developers. Franchise creator Shigeru Miyamoto originally intended to release a remix slash expansion of the Ocarina of Time within a year of its release. But when franchise director Eiji Aonuma protested, Miyamoto made a bet with him. If he could make a fully-fledged Zelda game in a year, then he would cancel the expansion. 
extinction. And that's how Majora's Mask was born, which impressively ended up releasing just 17 months after Ocarina hit stores. Not quite a year, but not bloody bad. Number 10. Shenmue's weather was accurate to 1986 Yokosuka. Right, okay, Shenmue, or Shenmue if you're going to be boring about it, is a mind-meltingly ahead of its time game in so many areas. And another element that you probably never even thought about is the game's weather. But it turns out players who beat the game and opt to venture through the story for a second time gain the ability to experience the weather as entirely accurate to the real Yokosuka in 1986. Now to achieve this, Sega used meteorological reports from the era to ensure that the real climate from the period would be reflected in the game. In a title with an already mind-boggling amount of detail, that is quite a lot. Number 9. Quake Guy was originally voiced by Trent Reznor. Though it's no secret at all that Quake's music was composed by Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails, you probably didn't know that the game's protagonist, aka Quake Guy slash Ranger, was also voiced by Reznor as well. All of those grunts and death rattles that you can hear during gameplay were performed by Reznor himself. And while it's tough to notice during gameplay, the isolated voiceover files make it much easier to discern his distinctive vocal tenor. It sure is funny to think about Reznor recording all of those ridiculous sounds, especially whenever he appeared in media around that time. He was very much like, all right, things are a bit bleak, aren't they? Bloody hell. Do you want this this song that will melt your face off? (laughs) Bloody hell. That's how he talks, by the way. Clearly, he's been putting on an accent this entire time. Number eight, Kingdom Hearts was greenlit because of a literal elevator pitch. Now, here's the thing, guys. I love me a good elevator pitch. In fact, I took the concept, tweaked it a little bit, and took it to uh, Gamescom recently, where it was the escalator pitch where I interviewed developers, but they only had the amount of time it took to ride an escalator to tell me everything about these games. So I love them. I love them. And to find out that Kingdom Hearts was actually made all because somebody was in an elevator was like... All right, mate, how's it going? Oh, not too bad. Oh, by the way, I'll tell you, you make games, don't you? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I've got a good idea of a game. Imagine, right, if it was Final Fantasy, right, yeah? Uh, but it was Disney as well. Oh, that's okay, mate, just two of the biggest IPs in the world at the moment. Yeah, that'd be easy to pull together. Yeah, I thought, thought you'd like that. thought you'd like that. Celebrators are uh, taking a long time. I haven't even closed the doors, mate. That'll be why. Yep. Yes, the actual conversation was between Shinji Hashimoto and Hironobu Sakaguchi. And though Tetsuya Nomura, who overheard this chatter, was swiftly brought on board as director, the game didn't get greenlit until Hashimoto luckily ended up in an elevator with a Disney executive. Hashimoto was able to make his swift pitch, which was evidently accepted. See there? There we go. That skit that I did before more close to life than I care to really. Uh, I was there. I was there. And there, I was cleaning. I was cleaning the floors. Just very quietly, just sweep it and dust into a, into a corner. Number seven, there is a playable PS3 build of Gears of War 3. Though the prospect of seeing a Gears of War game on PlayStation definitely seems more like a possibility in light of recent events, it previously seemed like a pure pipe dream. And yay it, in 2020, Kotaku reported on the mysterious existence of a PS3 build of Gears of War 3. It was later revealed that Epic Games created the build as a tech test for Unreal Engine 3, rather than because they actually wanted it bring the franchise to the PS3 at the time, which is a big old boo. But in 2021, the PS3 build was even released online, though you would need a PS3 dev kit in order to play it. Still, pretty cool. Number six, the PlayStation's name is a play on Workstation. Though the PlayStation is an immediately catchy and memorable name for Sony's legendary family of gaming hardware, have you ever thought about the most obvious thing of all, which is the origin of its name? No, because you've probably got better things to do. Yeah, fair enough, but I don't. Now, this might shock many who've never actually given it much consideration, but the moniker is actually a play on the word workstation, as in a computer used primarily for work purposes. This was confirmed by an excerpt from Reiji Asakura's book Revolutionaries at Sony, where former Sony CEO Ken Kutaragi said that the company's executives struggled to comprehend the naming convention. Number five, Grand Theft Auto was born because of a glitch in a racing game. Now, Grand Theft Auto is such a mammoth IP that it was impossible to consider its existence as being a mere fluke, and yet, here we are. You see, the original GTA began life as a racing game called Race and Chase, with players controlling criminals as they attempted to flee the police. But a bug in the game's code caused the cops to be excessively aggressive, ramming and 
hunting the player with reckless abandon. At this point, the people at Proto Rockstar, aka DMA Design, realized that they had something genuinely fun on their hands, and so refined the glitch into a genuine feature around which they shaped the building blocks of what would become GTA. And that is absolutely wild, right? Number four, Metal Gear Solid's English dub was recorded in just some lad's house. Though Metal Gear Solid's voice acting is still fondly recalled an entire quarter century later, the process of recording those voluminous reams of dialogue was decidedly less glamorous than you might expect. You see, the English-speaking voice cast have spoken at length many times over the years about how they recorded their dialogue in a house in Los Angeles where just one room had been rather unconvincingly converted into a sound recording studio. Now, it's at this point here that I'm drawn back to my early days of starting in voiceover work, where I used to go upstairs, build a little fort using pillows, put the cover over the top, and speak directly into it. Honestly, I've never had deader sound than audio. It sounded absolutely amazing. This actually sounds worse in the current day and age. But I'm not as sweaty. I, I, I would have, sometimes have to record with my shirt off because it used to get that bad. Yeah. That's an image you didn't need. As a result, lines had to be continually stopped and re-recorded due to passing traffic getting picked up on the recordings. Uh, Brilliant. You can even hear some actual traffic noise in the master audio tracks. Thankfully, though, the aggressive audio compression applied to make all the dialogue fit into two PS1 discs meant that said traffic couldn't actually be heard within the actual game. Number three, Sony thought Crash Bandicoot might break everyone's PlayStations. Now, Crash Bandicoot is, of course, one of the PlayStation's seminal video games, but Sony were legitimately worried that it would actually break PlayStations upon launch. In order to get the game running on the nascent hardware, developer Naughty Dog had to employ some magical workarounds, namely having the console constantly load data from the game disc as the player ventured through a level rather than loading it all up front. This led Sony to run the numbers and they started to fear that the PlayStation CD drive could end up failing after about three weeks of playing Crash Bandicoot. Thankfully though, that didn't turn out to be the case. But if it did, wow. I've heard of like a console system seller, but a console destroyer, that is a completely different prospect. Number two, the Xenomorph AI in Alien Isolation has two brains. Now, if you're wondering why Alien Isolation's Xenomorph is so damn adept at hunting you down, it's because the wizards at Creative Assembly effectively kitted him out with two brains for the price of of one. The Xeno's first brain monitors the player's location at all times, while the second brain controls where the Xenomorph goes in pursuit of you. Basically, the first brain feeds clues to the second brain as to where you might be, ensuring that players are unable to relax no matter where they are. That's why it will always find you even if you stay in the same location, not making a peep. It's a really impressive piece to see it all work together. And it's surprising that most other games haven't used that. And number one, Nintendo owns the rights to two Mario-themed pornos. Right, so Nintendo inexplicably owns the rights to two Mario-themed Ron Jeremy starring porn films, Super Hornio Brothers and, of course, the smash hit sequel Super Hornio Brothers 2, which were produced at the same time as the official 1993 live adaptation of Super Mario Brothers. Now, fearing damage to their precious brand, Nintendo surmised that the simplest way to resolve this issue was to just buy the rights to the films and then halt the distribution, which they did. And for the next 15 or so years, Super Horneo Brothers was only whispered about in the darker corners of the web. That is, until digitized copies began to find their way online. Great. Cool. Ron Jeremy. What a f- scumbag. Right. I I wish there was a more positive end to that, but there wasn't. Anyway, I'll end things on a nice note there because, uh, hey, you made it through the video. I hope that you enjoyed that. And let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. And also put your suggestions for next week's episode down there as well. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me on my social medias or you can follow Sai, my lovely editor, over on her social medias as well. But before I go, here's a bit of trivia that I think that you do need to know. And that is... Surprise, surprise, you're a massive ledge and you deserve the best things in life like love, happiness and success. And do not let anything or anyone else tell you otherwise, all right? I want you to go out there and smash your life goals today because why? Why is that, Simon Miller? Why? Here's why. Because I believe in you. I believe in you and you need to believe in yourself. Now get out there. Do it. Do it. (laughs) Do it. (laughs) As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.